It is 90.3 KEXP, and we stream all over the world at KEXP.org. My name is Troy Nelson. A very, very exciting day here at KEXP because we have the very talented and wonderful Dan Deacon in the house today. So, Dan, if you're ready to uh, roll, I know our listeners are ready.
sweaty. Why didn't I think a fan would be a good idea until a moment ago? Can you feel the lightning covering your skin? It's a nightmare. It's your Dan Deacon live here on KEXP. Fantastic stuff, man. Thank you so much, Dan, for stopping by. Anytime, anytime. Uh, yes, working up a sweat indeed. This room is... Y'all got a towel by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody got a towel? Bring this man a towel, please. Um, this room, yes, it's just kind of a box with uh, very little air. But when we move into our new home, which is going to be soon... Within the year, our new live room is going to be big. It's going to have air in it, <laughs> which is good. We could be in an igloo inside of a cave of ice, <laughs> and I would be a puddle. And you still... 
Uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Both of those songs are found on the new album, Gliss Riffer. And Gliss Riffer, that title actually has a meaning. Can you tell our listeners what that is? I would say it sort of has a meaning. Mm-hmm. It, uh, the words themselves contain meaning. I don't know if the phrase in conjunction with the record like has anything. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then I came upon the Gliss Riffer when I was walking the plains looking for my, my soul. Yes. Because um, that's how I talk when I'm by myself. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, well, Gliss is a, a music term for, it means to slide. It's short for glissando. And um, a lot of my music is like made with an oscillator or starts with these like sort of like scalar cascading sort of sweeps. Mm-hmm. And a riffer is like one who plays riffs, like right. specifically sick riffs. Yeah, um, sick riffs. So I, I also just like the way um, it sounds. Like I have a side project called Pardon's Bird and another project called Stint Riddler. Mm-hmm. So Gliss Riffer sort of just like fit within the way like, like if, if like, if we were like proto humans and we were hanging out, I feel like the language of the people I would be in would all be like dish stinker or something like that, you know, stuff like that. So. I love dish stinker. Dish stinker. That we, is we kind of perfect, <laughs> actually. Uh, so you would definitely have your hands in so many different uh, genres of music. Of course, electronics are involved a lot of the time, but you come from a very interesting background. You have played tuba. You have uh, with you uh, know Langhorn Slim. Are you guys still friends? Is that Sean? Is that oh, yeah. somebody that you? He's. Uh, I love that guy. We talk about making a record. Uh, consistently every f- five to seven months since 1999. <laughs> it's going to happen. So. One of these days it'll happen. You've been in a grindcore band. I mean, you just have a very uh, wide variety of musical styles. I feel like, but I, I'm, I think I'm like one of the first generations of musicians to like uh, grow up as Wikipedia was emerging. Mm. So it's like, I feel like if you were to be like, Oh, and like, of course, you were in 17 ska band. You know what I mean? Like, right. I feel like anyone 10 years older is like, thank God this didn't happen when I was alive. When I was alive. Because <laughs> now, of course, I'm existing in the plane and I'm just pure It's kind of true because some of it, it doesn't need to be mentioned. You no, know? no, I would love yeah. if none of it got yeah. mentioned. But uh, <laughs> Especially when you, like, you transition from, when you go, like, I consider like a lot of my early records to be student works. Yeah. And um, I used to think that that was kind of like a cop-out, but then I started reading about... Uh, how Steve Reich has all these like early pieces that he like actively tries to destroy, and I think right. that's so awesome. You're and actually, Perez did the same thing, so we'll cite we'll cite the masters as precedent. Yeah, you're absolutely right though, because when I was in uh, let's see, when I was a junior, sophomore, junior in high school, like my first band that I was in, it sort of sounded what became like Lincoln Park, like angry white boy metal, bro metal, if you will, and that is a really uh, embarrassing time of, in my life, and why we recorded two albums to <laughs> CD for it to for ever exist. It was important. It, it, it seemed like it at the time. Lots of swearing and lots of repeating a phrase as it builds like they did in the 90s. You repeat it and then it kicks in and then you just keep repeating it but louder. Yeah, that's kind of what I still do. It was, <laughs> well, you make it work and somehow make it sound awesome. I just think it's important, you know, to make those musical mistakes when you're, you know, trying to figure out what you like, especially True. as it, like, and 10 years ago it was really much more difficult to discover something that wasn't just mainstream you know what i mean you had to really like i'm gonna go to the record store i've returned like 200 cans i can buy (laughs) one cd with this i have no idea what it sounds like i'm gonna buy it exclusively based on the cover art i pray to all gods that have ever existed that it isn't terrible yeah um 200 so, cans. Did you? Add, that's funny you say that because in my small little town, we had this thing called the Golden Goat, and you would bring cans to it and just put it in there, and it would, you know, dispense quarters or whatever. Ours didn't have any sort of awesome like serio miserable, serio miserable, serio miserable sort of misery. But uh, yeah, we just go to the beer distributor and be like, luckily there's many alcoholics on our street, so we can buy comic books and records this week. Right. Right. That I was reading about that you were going to be part of this installation at the Metro, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh God! And this was like a year and a half of your life of working on something. When mm-hmm. two days before it was supposed to happen, they pulled the plug on it. It's true. Now I, I realized that well, must the plug have been... was pulled. The plug was pulled. We should we should phrase it that way. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't want to get a letter in the mail being like, "Gotcha, Deacon, we need to talk again." Right. But I just was. I mean, that must have been disheartening. But I just want to know. Yes, it was. What little good came out of that? Was there any pieces of music that you got to oh, yeah. hang on to that maybe you used in the future? I mean, I don't know. Why I'm standing like uh, that character in The Master during this whole interview. It's like, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna touch the wall and tell you that it's a pane of glass. Um, 
Yeah, it was a good learning experience. And I think it was like one of the breaking points in my life where I had been working on something for so long and put, there might have been 150 people involved in like the entire ensemble. And um, it was, I, de devastating would be the word right. I would use to describe when it de vanished. Yeah, But uh, the, the music remained and it also just showed me how I had really like, and I didn't realize this until after, but I'd really fallen in love with logistical impracticality mm -hmm. and how that became like my art. And I wanted to make things that were like, I think it stemmed from me starting to play on the floor. And then I'd like go to like Coachella and be like, you can't play on the floor. And I was like, it can be done. And I became stubborn and more interested in seeing if it could happen rather than wondering if it should. Right. You know what I mean? And I think the Met show, while it would have been awesome and it could have happened, mm -hmm. um, was larger than it needed to be and larger than it should have been. And I think that falling apart and then that coupled with the two animal collective tours that fell apart that whole year for me was just like what is happening yeah because there was i don't know it was just like this lost year oh yeah it and would I, feel like the the gods were frowning upon you or something maybe they were with good reason <laughs> but um i don't know i think it made me try to remember what i loved about making music and why that's how i started to define myself and i think that's where the record came from was i was like why don't I just make a record that I can make by myself and I won't have to like have hundreds of meetings about making it. Right. And I think from that, from the ashes of the Met Project and the tours that fell apart, this record sort of like emerged in the smoke. What I think is interesting also about you is that this day and age, a lot of people get known for just putting their songs on the internet and blogs start talking about them, or they make these really crazy music videos. Sometimes the song isn't even great, but the music video is so good and it becomes sort of a weird uh, popular song because of the music video. But you, throughout the years, uh, have gained an audience from your live shows, which I think is really the way and the, the old school way to do it, but yet a way that uh, is a real testament to what kind of artist you are because I for Thank years you. people would tell me about your live shows they're like it's insane you have to see this he performs <laughs> on the ground it's not it, like anything you've seen before and so I uh, want to commend you for that and also Thank e you very much. each record keeps getting better and better and the uh, responses and the reviews are better with each record and this Gliss Thank Riffer you. record is really I think the best thing you've done to date and you've done a lot of great stuff I wish we talked every day around this time you j do you just need me to say that every <laughs> single day when you wake yeah, up and... texts would be fine too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll just be there next to you petting you as you wake up. And... I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right, Dan Deacon, the new album is called Gliss Riffer, and uh, I, ho I hope you're going to Numo's tonight because Dan Deacon will be performing at Numo's. And if you have a couple more for us, I know that I, myself, and our listeners would love to hear a couple more. Cool. I'm going to do uh, a synth improvisation that may or may not be terrible, awesome. and then I'll do uh, another song into it. Perfect. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for stopping by. It's Dan Deacon live here on KEXP Seattle. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much for having me. Dan Deacon live here at KEXP. Thank you so much for taking time out to stop by and perform for all of our listeners all over the world. So we really appreciate that. Pleasure was all mine. Awesome. Dan Deacon performing at Numos tonight. Go see him. Get the new album. The new album is called Gliss Riffer, and it's a brilliant record, and enjoy that. So once again, thanks to Dan Deacon and uh, the KEXP crew. My name is Troy Nelson. It's KEXP Seattle. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.